So Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 2. We're going to start reading at verse 2, and we're going to finish chapter 9, verse 12. Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since a king's word is supreme, who can say to him, what are you doing? Whoever obeys his command will come to no harm, and the wise will know the proper time and procedure, for there is a proper time and procedure for every matter. Though a person may be weighed down by misery, since no one knows the future, who can tell someone else what is to come? As no one has power over the wind to contain it, so no one has the power over the time of their death. And no one is discharged in time of war, so wickedness will not release those who practice it. All this I saw as I applied my mind to everything done under the sun. There's a time when a man lords it over others to his own hurt. Then too, I saw the wicked buried, those who used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this. This too is meaningless. When the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, people's hearts are filled with schemes to do wrong. Although a wicked person who commits a hundred crimes may live a long time, I know that it will go better with those who fear God, who are reverent before him. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. There is something else meaningless that occurs on earth. The righteous who get what the wicked deserve, and the wicked who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. So I commend the enjoyment of life because there is nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in their toil all the days of the life God has given them under the sun. When I applied my mind to know wisdom and to observe the labor that is done on earth, people getting no sleep day or night. Then I saw all that God has done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim they know, they cannot really comprehend it. So I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands but no one knows whether love or hate awaits them. All share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good, so with the sinful. As it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of people, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live, and afterwards they join the dead. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Go eat your food with gladness and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already approved what you do. Always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun all your meaningless days for this is your lot in life and in all your toilsome labor under the sun whatever your hand finds to do do it with all your might for in the realm of the dead 
where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net, or birds are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. So I'm Alan, I'm the elder at Felicity Chapel. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. It is a privilege to bring God's word to God's people wherever you are, even Ecclesiastes chapter 8. I want to, uh, it's appropriate for me to start with a thank you. Thank you for the fellowship and the partnership that our two churches are developing. Um, it is, I'm getting more and more excited. It was, I think Philip Street Chapel were late to the party in the excitement, but I'm certainly getting there. And I do appreciate the sacrifice you're making as a church for uh, the gospel in Bedminster. Let's pray as we come to God's word. Open our eyes, we pray, that we might see wonderful things out of your law, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So some years ago, I, I have a friend who used to go walking in Scotland quite a lot, and some years ago he gave me a call and he said, would you like to go to St. Kilda? I don't know if you know where St. Kilda is. St. Kilda is a rock, four, four rocks, in fact, in the North Atlantic. Go up to Scotland, on the west coast, you get the Inner Hebrides, and then you get these uh, larger islands, the Outer Hebrides, Uist and Lewis. Go 40 miles out into the North Atlantic, and there's a rock there called St. Kilda. People have lived on this rock for about 4,000 years, apparently. The, the, uh, uh, people have suggested that only about 180 people could live on there at any one time. They could farm enough sheep to make um, woolen jumpers, it's too, uh, too dangerous to go fishing, so they used to eat gannets and puffins. And in 1930, 36 people were left, and they said, actually, we don't like living here anymore. Can we please come to Scotland? So there's this rock out in the middle of nowhere, and he wanted to go and see uh, St. Kilda. And you can go, and, and there's a little row of houses and some sheep pens and things like that. And we knew a guy with a yacht uh, up in Scotland, so we went. And we arrived, and we got on the boat, and I've never seen Scotland like it. There was not a breath of wind. And the sea was like a mirror. You usually go to Scotland for the wind. That's why surfers go to the top of Scotland. But there was nothing, absolutely nothing. And that's my excuse for what's coming next. Because I didn't get the chance to get my sea legs. Yeah, you're supposed to uh, spend some time on a boat so you can get... Uh, used to the movement of the boat, but we didn't have that opportunity because that day, as we were just gliding along this flat sea, he said, if you want to go to St. Kilda, you need to go now because some weather's coming in and I don't want to be out in the North Atlantic as that weather goes in. So what we will do, he said, our skipper, Andy, who was very conscious of safety, he said, we will motor out into the North Atlantic and uh, during the night, Okay, and when you um, uh, go out into the night, you need someone on watch all the time. So we need to get some <clears throat> people on watch uh, for two hour stints throughout the night as we motor through towards St. Kilda. So my friend was going to take the first watch and I was going to take the second. <clears throat> so here's the thing. Seasickness, I understand, is your brain being told competing messages. So... As we go out in the North Atlantic, and this is calm, okay, but it's the, it's the Atlantic, it's the ocean. I've never been on the ocean before. It's certainly not in a yacht that simply just follows the path of the waves. So the, the boat goes up and down, and up and down, and up and down. It's constantly just moving up and down. Your stomach feels it, and your ears are telling you that you're going up and you're going down. And if you're below, cabin, if you're below deck in your cabin, your eyes are telling you you just sat still in a room. And so your brain starts to get confused. Am I just sat still or am I going up and down with these waves? So I was uh, below deck 
lying down with my eyes closed, trying to convince myself that I was going up and down, trying not to give my brain any false impressions. And I was thinking, okay, what am I going to do? What am I going to do when the guy, when my friend comes down and says I'm on watch? So I was going to get my life jacket on as soon as possible, make my way to the deck as soon as possible, and look out at the horizon. I've done this before, it works. If I can find a fixed point and focus my attention on there, then my eyes are starting to tell my brain the same message as my stomach and my ears, and everything's okay, and I'm not seasick. So my friend comes down at one o'clock in the morning, and he says, Alan, you're on watch. So I jump out of bed, but I've already got all my kit on and everything, obviously, and put on my life vest, and I run as, as safely as you can, and, and, uh, and uh, um, the deck out, up onto the deck, and immediately throw up. <laughs> because... Within a split second, I arrived on deck, looked out, and there was no horizon. For a start, it was the middle of the night, okay, and we're in the middle of the North Atlantic. There's nothing there. But we're also surrounded by this dense fog. Later on in the night, as I was throwing up over the side of the boat, I couldn't see the water. The fog was that dense. There was nothing there. And I could just feel myself going up and down, but all I could see was, was a boat and no fixed point. Longest two hours of my life, <laughs> apart from the birth of my son, probably. Because <laughs> I, I spent those two hours trying to find points of light on the horizon just to tell me what was going on. And I was throwing up every 30 minutes. And you look outside of this church and the society around us and people are seasick. They know something is going wrong. We're all feeling the waves being sent up and down. And there are no fixed points on the horizon for people to settle their eyes onto. Without God, everyone's seasick. And we see this in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and 9. There are some very odd, almost illogical steps that he takes. Mixed information, if you like, where our expectations for life and reality are at odds. He says, although a wicked person who commits a hundred crimes may live a long time, I know it will go better with those who fear God. It will not go well with the wicked, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow, he says. So uh, are the wicked going to live a long time, or will their days not lengthen? It's the same word, in fact, prolong. Will their days prolong or will their days not prolong? And on what basis does he claim it will be well with those who fear God? And then having shared the vanity of injustice, which we'll get to shortly, he says there's something else meaningless that occurs on earth. The righteous who get what the wicked deserve and the wicked who get what the righteous deserve. He then goes on and says... So I commend the enjoyment of life. Look around and you see all the injustice and we can see that. There are people who are switching off their news apps now because it's so distressing to see what happens in the world. And our teacher says, so I commend joy. I commend the enjoyment of life. Remember the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy by Bobby McFerrin, if, if there are people of that age. Don't worry, be happy. Go away and read the lyrics. It's just depressing what he's singing about. He's got no better advice other than don't worry, be happy. You're putting everybody down with your miserable face. Just cheer up. That's not good advice. That's not what our teacher is doing, as we'll see. There are these odd connections. Again, enjoy life with your wife whom you love all the days of this meaningless life, this vain life. These odd little connections, these odd little logical steps, illogical steps perhaps, are the points of light on the horizon. That's where he's hidden those lights, if you like. As you go through, you need to think. He's not laying it out on a page for you. You need to look at those odd statements and you see that that 
is where you find the horizon and you can cope with the waves. We're going to go through the waves first. We're going to go through the passage, look at the waves, and we're going to go back to those points of light. It's worth saying that that's not the order he takes them in. He really throws us information pretty much in the same way that life throws us information. We don't live life thematically, do we? We don't get all the bad stuff done and then all the joyful stuff done in life. We get life throwing things at us in all kinds of, um, at all kinds of times, in all kinds of orders. And that's pretty much how he seems to order his, uh, his, his book. So the waves, verses 2 to 5 of chapter 8, talking about obedience to the king. He starts with some advice on how to navigate human authority that we could translate for today's workplace. Do your job, treat your boss with respect, use your time and energy wisely, do your job uh, diligently and you'll be okay. There is a right way to do the right thing. You can apply this to your boss, and if you're self-employed, you can apply this to your relationship with His Majesty's Revenue and Customs. We are all under some kind of authority. You can see Daniel, chapter 1 of his book, working this out, very wise in the way he, he approaches human authority while staying absolutely rock-solid uh, in his relationship with God. The point is, you are under the authority of someone else. And if nothing else, you need to recognize that and the wise deal with it and navigate within those constraints. It's wise advice. But I think perhaps he's just warming up in this passage. That sense of limitation, that sense of being under authority, of being powerless, continues. Verses 6 to 8. You don't know the future. You don't know how long you've got. That verse, uh, verse 8, I think it is, no one is discharged in time of war. It's possible he's speaking about death there as well. The Hebrew is that war, the last enemy, if you like. One commentator has said, every man must advance, and every man must advance alone to single combat, and every man in succession must fall Everyone is in the same situation here. No one has power over the time of their death. And you can't escape it even through some wicked scheme. You are powerless. Living with limited authority even over your very days. Verses, eight, uh, verses 9 to 11 and 14. There is no, uh, you've got no control of authority over you. No control over death. Then he says there's no control or you're living under the burden of injustice. As man lords it over others and the wicked receive praise. And what we see so often is that it teaches us that we can get away with it. So what do you get for living well? You see what's happening? You instinctively expect leaders to work for their people, but often they don't. You instinctively know death is an enemy, but one you can't defeat. You instinctively expect justice. You have an idea of what justice is, but it's in short supply. You know these things, and yet looking at life under the sun tells you something different, and you find yourself throwing up over the side of the boat. But surely, we come to this passage, passage and we say, God loves justice, acquitting the guilty and content, condemning the innocent. The Lord detests them both. God loves justice, so what's God doing about all this? The teacher's answer is, I don't know, and nobody does. Verses uh, 16 to 17, and the uh, first verse of not, um, chapter 9 as well. The teachers thought about it, and he's concluded that we don't know what God is doing. Then I saw all that God has done. 
He's, he's looked at everything. He's observed all, all the labor that is done on earth. And he saw all that God has done. And no one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim they know, and he claims to be wise, the teacher, they cannot really comprehend it. So he concludes that the righteous and the wise and all they do are in God's hands. Powerless over authority, over death, over injustice. Powerless even just to figure it out. What's happening? What is God doing? And then as we go on in chapter 9, ultimately everyone just dies. The righteous and the wicked, the good and the evil, the clean and the unclean, the one who sacrifices and the one who doesn't, all share a common destiny. The same event happens to all. It's brutal, isn't it? Where is justice? Everyone just dies. And he ends our passage by saying it's all just chance. It doesn't matter if you're swift, strong, wise, brilliant, or learned. It's basically the Justice, Justice League, isn't it? As he goes through that list, I don't know if you're any uh, DC or Marvel fans, you think of the Justice League, X-Men, or the Avengers, the swift, strong, wise, brilliant, or learned. It's not Earth's mightiest heroes. Chance happens to everybody. But we do have verse 4, chapter 9. The living has hope. A living dog is better than a dead lion. Why are the living better off than the dead? Is it a chance to serve one another? To love? To enjoy community? To know God? Is it ice cream? The reason he gives for the living being better off, is that they know they will die. That's dark, isn't it? That's dark. Reminds you of chapter 7 we, we heard the, um, the other week. A day of death is better than the day of birth. It's better to go to the house of the morning than to go to the house of feasting. The living should take this to heart. This is where you get wisdom. And he's taking us to that point so that we can lay it to heart. It seems sometimes he obsesses about death, but he's taking us to that place of wisdom. Powerless against rule, powerless against death, powerless against injustice, against time and chance, powerless even just to figure out what on earth God is doing. The point is you're not in control. Now, to be clear, we need to be calling rulers to account. We can do that now to, to some extent through our democratic systems, which um, clearly were not around for the supreme king. And there are ways to do the right things. And we want to be advancing medical science. And we need to be fighting injustice in all its forms. We need to be doing our part to make society better. But the point is that we will always be doing that. Ultimately, we're living in a world where we're limited and confused. It's a constant toil in life under the sun. We're not in control, but God is. It is God working. So what's he doing? Ecclesiastes 7 again. When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad... Consider this, God has made the one as well as the other. God has made the one as well as the other. Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 20. The creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. All creation was subjected to frustration. The Greek word for frustration there, or futility, is used in the Greek Old Testament for vanity or vapor. 
It is God who has subjected creation to this vanity and to this frustration, to this vapor. The ways we're experiencing are not a world out of control. It's out of our control. But God is working. And so we lay it to heart. Job says to his wife, and this is not advice for the, uh, the newlywed, he says, you speak as one of the foolish women who speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil or trouble? In all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. The swell of the waves gets us looking with a sense of urgency for the horizon. And he's put little points of light into the passage, at the very points where it seems to be most confusing. Although a wicked person who commits a hundred crimes may live a long time, I know that it will go better with those who fear God, who are reverent before him. I know, he says, I know, in comparison to I observed or I saw. Throughout this passage, throughout the book, he's constantly looking at life under the sun and saying, I saw this, I observed this. Here he's saying, I know. Meanwhile, we groan, said Paul, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, for we live by faith, not by sight. And we know, he says in Romans chapter 8, we're going to stick here for a little while, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We live by faith, not by sight, because we know that God works for the good of those who love him. It's a wonderful verse, and I think exactly relevant here, and is often, I think, perhaps abused. Two things, Paul's vision is on God. Paul is not saying, we can see what he's doing. He's not saying trust in your ability to rationalize events, to, sell, to tell a, a meaningful story. That works for a sitcom, okay? In the course of 30 minutes, something happens and it all gets kind of sorted out at the end. That's not what life is like. Rather, and you go to Romans chapter 8 and you read through that passage, he's talking about God who is for us. He's talking about us not being separated from the love of Christ. So Romans 8.28 is not saying once you've figured out what God is doing, you'll be happy. He's saying when you can't figure it out, trust God. His vision is firmly on God. And it's a long distance vision. He starts that passage by saying, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. That's the focus when he's talking about things working out for good. The glory to be revealed. In 1992, you may have heard this story before. In 1992, there was a cargo ship going from China to America. One of these big container ships. And it hit a storm in the Pacific. And 12 of these big containers were thrown off the deck and, and crashed into the sea. And at least one of them opened up their doors and spilled the contents of this container out into the Pacific Ocean. These, uh, the contents were 29,000 bath toys, mostly yellow plastic ducks. <laughs> so those, these ducks, this was 1992, these ducks were drifting onto beaches for over 20 years, turning up in Hawaii, Australia, Indonesia, and Chile. Some of these ducks apparently traveled to Alaska, then westward to Japan, back to Alaska. They drifted northwards through the Bering Strait, became trapped in the Arctic ice pack, moved slowly across the pole. Five or six years later, they reached the North Atlantic where the ice thaws and they head eastward uh, past Greenland, and some of them make landfall, I think, into the UK. They started out as little yellow ducks, but over time they faded to white, being bleached by the sun and the seawater. And oceanographers have watched them and have, have learned so much about the currents of the Pacific Ocean just by watching how these, these little plastic ducks float around the sea 
and the time it takes them to wash up on these various beaches around the world. <clears throat> Do you get the image yet? <clears throat> the great ocean, in all its power and its majesty and the mysterious currents, is God. And you're the plastic duck. You haven't got a clue what's going on. And you're just floating around on this ocean. And you look closely enough at the Church of Christ, and an observer should be able to learn something about God and how he works. But the point for us tonight is that someday you'll wash up on a beach and the journey will be over. You may have had to travel the Arctic. You may have had to be frozen into the ice pack for five or six years, bleached white by the sun, but you will arrive. Until then, your job is to, uh, is to float, is to tr trust God and his mysterious providence. Joseph, Joseph's story is, is the, the, one of the key ones you turn to, isn't it, when you're looking at, at the providence of God. And it's very easy for us to read that story. It doesn't take long to read. And we get to uh, the end, and we see Joseph and his brothers slapping themselves each on the back and say, oh, isn't it funny, eh? We were going to kill you, you know. <laughs> it doesn't really do it justice, does it? Imagine the suffering that Joseph went through, sold as a slave by his brothers. And that was the better option. But now he's doing pretty well in Potiphar's house, and he's thinking this, what it was, this is what it was about. God works for good for those who are called according to his purpose. But then he ends up in jail for for following God's uh, commands, staying honest and true to God. He ends up in jail. He thinks, what is God doing? And then, then two people come along with dreams that he interprets. And he thinks, this could be it. This could be my route out. But no, he's there for another two years. And perhaps those two years were just long enough for him to stop trying to figure out God's providence. But then he's called up before Pharaoh. This is it. He's going to become the savior of the known world because of what uh, God reveals through him. But in fact, God says, no, you just wait a little bit longer. There's more, actually. Another seven or so years, and his brothers turn up. And Joseph perhaps begins to see. As his brothers and his family actually come into Egypt, he sees it's not about me at all, is it? It's not about me. God is bringing his people into Egypt, placing them there for whatever reason, God's providence. That is the best place for them to grow as a nation. And then he's going to take, he's going to redeem them from Egypt and put them into the promised land. And all this mighty movement of history is ultimately so that embedded into the history of God's people, Israel, is that picture of what Christ does for us. Blows your mind, doesn't it? What God is working in that man's life. How much have we dwelt on those topics, like those stories, in order to comprehend what Christ has done for us? Just to teach us a lesson, just to point to Christ. Everything points to Christ. So trust God. Something bigger than you is happening. Our joy is not in controlling it, but being a part of it. My heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I've calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. That's Psalm 131. I know, I know it will go better with those who fear God. With those who fear God. We had a, a definition of the fear of God at the beginning of this series. It's from Mike Reeves. It is the overwhelmed devotion of children marveling at the kindness and righteousness and glory and complete magnificence of the Father. I think of Peter. 
I think of Peter. Right at the start of Jesus' ministry, you remember that occasion when Jesus preaches from Peter's boat? So Peter hears uh, Jesus uh, preach, and then Jesus says, let's go out and do some fishing. And Peter says, this is the wrong time of day. But they catch an enormous catch of fish, and the nets are beginning to break. And Peter sees something of God in this man. He's heard him preach, and he's seen him uh, with this miraculous catch of fish. And what does he say? Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. I'm not worthy to be in this man's presence, he says. Three years later, what has Peter seen then? Peter has seen Jesus showing authority over demons. He's seen Jesus raise people from the dead. He's seen, he's seen Jesus heal any disease. He's seen him calm a storm and make the, the raging waters flat. He's seen him transfigured with the glory of God on a mountaintop. He's seen this glorious man offer himself to die on a cross and three days later, rise again. He has seen the risen Lord. Peter, three years later, is in no doubt at all who Jesus is. And it is more than he's ever imagined. And he's in no doubt who he is. Because he's known his own sin and his foolishness. He's denied him three times. The gulf between Jesus and Peter has widened massively in terms of who they are. And yet... Peter's got another unsuccessful fishing trip, and someone calls from the shore, throw your net over the other side. And they do, and they catch all these fish. And someone nudges Peter and said, it's Jesus, it's the Lord. And so what does Peter do then? After all he's known and all he's seen, is he still saying, depart from me? No, he's jumping into the water to get to Jesus as soon as he can. Imagine it's a Wednesday afternoon. I don't know why Wednesday afternoon. Nothing happens on a Wednesday afternoon. So let's put it Wednesday afternoon. Whatever you're doing on a Wednesday afternoon, you hear a noise and you see a light fill up the sky. And somehow you instinctively know it's Jesus. And he's coming again. This might interfere with your particular view on the, the end times. I don't know. But let's just imagine Jesus is returning. And you're thrilled. Everyone sees him. There is no doubt who he is because he's arrived. History is ended. All eyes are on him. Everything is melted because Jesus has arrived. Jesus tells us there will be people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what's coming on the world. People throwing themselves under mountains because they don't want to meet Jesus. And yet your hearts, you're thrilled. Jesus says to his people, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. In the sight of that majesty and that awesome power and authority, we'll be standing up. What makes someone stand up before the glory of God? It is the fear of God that enables us to delight in his majesty and his glory. It's the kind of awe that says the best, the safest place to be is in his arms. I heard a story, I read a story. It's not my story, so it's, it's um, sometimes it's a dodgy thing to give an illustration that's not, not your own. But it's a, it's a story, it was someone who was recounting this story from, a, from America. It was a lady, she was saying she was out um, in front of her house and um, talking to some neighbors, and their, their, their sidewalk goes up a hill. Um, and at the top of the hill was their nine-year-old boy with a bicycle who shouted, look at this. And she, she turned around in fear, as you do when a young boy says, look at this. <laughs> but he wasn't on the bicycle. He just let the bicycle go by itself. And in some mystery of physics, it didn't fall down. It just kept going down the hill and went straight into the side of their car, a new car, new to them. And they all looked at what had just happened and they looked back up at the boy and the boy was running down the hill and the mother said she expected him to run straight into the house, straight into his room, 
and closed the door behind him. But he didn't. He ran straight down the hill, straight into the arms of his father. That was the safest place for him to be. So with that as the basis, I know it will go well for those who fear God. The teacher says, I commend the enjoyment of life. The life that God has given them under the sun, he says. How do you get on with life when the world is in such a crazy mess? How do you live in the light of death? He says there's nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Now, me being English, I read that and say, well, there's nothing better to do. But I don't think that's what he's saying. I think he's saying there is nothing better to do than to trust God and get on with what he's given you to do. Go eat your food with gladness and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already approved what you do. Now, clearly, God doesn't approve everything that everyone does, but I think he's talking to the one who fears God. So God has approved what you do because he's given it to you to do it. This is the life that he's given us to live. This, yes, this meaningless, this vain, this vaporous, this toilsome life. This is what God would have us do for him. Get on with it. It can be simple as the stuff of life part of what he's given us to do of course is be the church and all that the church needs to do in its community philippians chapter 2 therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed so now not only as in my presence but much more in my absence work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is god who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure He says, do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Shining as lights in the world. Sometimes it's just a matter of not grumbling. You see how gloriously down to earth this is we have a god-given job to do freed by faith to live life well in a messed up world shining like stars how's that working out for us it's actually harder than it sounds isn't it just to get on with life for god so that people will see and perhaps they'll be wondering how does this make sense you're showing them the horizon the thing that makes sense of all the world. Thankfully, we have Jesus as our example and as our righteousness. Jesus lived this out. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. His delight, we were told in Isaiah 11, his delight was in the fear of the Lord. Christ lived it. And God clothes you in it as the righteousness of christ given to us by faith if you can't live this out but you're trusting in christ then he's lived it out for you but also god is working in you by his spirit bringing it to completion at the day of jesus christ so if you're feeling a little queasy as you're reading the news If you're wondering what on earth is going on, turn to Jesus once again and remind yourself about him and how he faced the mess of the world, submitting to the Father, trusting him, and shining as as the light of the world. You go to Jesus.